Wow. Yeah. Alice Gates was still there. Okay, folks, it's the top of the hour. Shall we get started? Yep. All right, great. Can all see the presentation screen? We can. All right, great. I call this meeting of the San Diego chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution to order. Would you please stand? <laughs> Since Reverend DeLong isn't with us today, I will lead us in the uh, invocation. Almighty God, please ask your blessing on this chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution, as our purpose is to promote sound learning and true patriotism and to further all that is good in our community. So we pray that you will strengthen our hands in all that we undertake, that we may serve our nation to your honor and glory. Amen. 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 Color Guard, would you please advance the colors? Color Guard, attend hut. Here's it. Colors, forward. March. Mark time, march. Color Guard, halt. Left, face. Patriot Newton, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America and to and the to Republic the for which it which stands, stands, one nation, nation under God, God, God it is and it is liberty, liberty and justice, justice for, for all. all. Please close the doors. Ten hugs. About face. Hugs. The colors. Patriot Fagan, would you please lead us in the singing of God Bless America? Yes. Thank you. God bless America and that I love stand beside her and guide her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountain to the prairie to the ocean, white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home. Bless America, sweet home, home. Thank you. Compatriot Hinshaw, may I ask you to lead the, us in the pledge to the Tsar? <clears throat> we descendants of the heroes of the American Revolution, who by their sacrifices, Thank you. May I ask you to leave us in the pledge to the start? Color Guard Commander, please retire the guard. 
Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, welcome some honored guests. Uh, first, we have uh, Paula Jo Cahoon. Paula Jo, it's great to see you. I met Paula Jo uh, last year on, I believe it was December 17th? I believe so. The reason was one of the... Yeah, it was one of the two days we were allowed to place wreaths at Miramar. And I just happened to run into her and um, I heard a lot about her uh, from a lot of uh, a lot of our elder statesmen. And it was a pleasure to finally meet her. So thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for asking me. I re this is such an honor. I'm so happy to see the sons this morning. Thank you. Uh, we also have with us uh, Judy Brooks. Uh, who is the red, white, and blue CAR uh, chapter director. Uh, Judy, would you like to say a few words, please? Am I on all right? You are on great. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm not too sure about using this iPad. <laughs> it is great to, to join with all of you sons. Um, and I, I just wanted to give you a little report on um, our society. We are uh, hoping and planning on having an in-person meeting on the 16th of May and celebrating the, um, actually the 125th birthday of uh, the CAR and doing uh, our annual meeting to cover two meetings with a lot of awards. Um, we are hoping to have your color guard, but. I can understand if you have a big problem on the 15th, you have a big project to do and we can catch you another time. I do have, well, we have 26 members, but of that 26, I'm lucky if I have nine kids actually being active at the time. And I do have some young men, early, early teens. And uh, I think one of them is a tween. Um, who I have a feeling would be very interested in, in joining with you guys at some point. When we get our national program, it is usually a history kind of uh, story we've done. Uh, oh, I love the year when we did John, George Washington's that was his boyhood and how it helped shape his character. So we were learning about the laws of civility. Um, and at the same time that we learn those things, then we are expected to hopefully present to SARs and DARs. So hopefully we can meet in person and get something done this year because last year we did very little other than actually survive. Apparently, state of California lost several of its uh, CAR societies during the pandemic. So uh, at least we are still functioning. We still have a budget and uh, we're hopeful for the future. And if you have any questions about the CAR, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Judy, I think it's wonderful what you're doing. <laughs> Judy, can I ask you a question? What is the, what is the theme of the CAR this this year, and do you have a pin to sell? We don't have it yet. We won't have it until they have uh, their national convention thing here. In uh, well, actually, it's coming up in the next couple of weeks, so we'll find out what the program is for this year. Okay, cool. Because I always like to buy the pin. <laughs> they have wonderful pins, don't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Judy, I, I don't want to speak for our color guard commander, but uh, some of our activities have changed slightly, and there's a possibility we might be able to support your event. Oh, that would be wonderful. We'll, we'll actually, we still have time. <laughs> still actually, have it's time. more than a possibility. We are going to support your event. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> and guess what? We are, we are having, it'll be a three o'clock in the afternoon meeting and uh, 
we had to change our venue. So we're at the San Marcos Historical Society at Walnut Grove Park in San Marcos. But I am planning, we are going to have, um, actually it's Kentucky Fried Chicken in a box. So you can, <laughs> after the meeting, you can have your dinner in the park. <laughs> That would be wonderful if you would show up. <laughs> I'd be so excited. And so would the kids. Wonderful. And, and what is the date on that, April? May no. 16th, Sunday, May 16th. Would you like to come and sing? You can lead the, the Star Spangled <laughs> Banner for us. <laughs> oh, see, you got me crying now. <laughs> uh, let me... Here's my email. Here's my email. It's P. My email is P J C uh -huh. Posey, P O S E Y, at AOL.com. All righty. I'll check with you and see if you're free. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, Jim Klingler is here. He usually uh, is able to attend our meetings. Jim, are you here? I can't see on our panel. I saw him on here. Okay. He may be muted. Oh, I don't see him on here. Yeah, I guess he uh, isn't able to attend today. Okay. With that, uh, today our guest speaker is noted author uh, Charles Fry from the Redlands chapter. Uh, for those of you who attended our February meeting, you will recall that Charlie discussed how the British reconnoitered in and around the Boston area. In a few moments, he will take us, he will talk to us about a little known patriot, Paul Dudley Sargent, and his participation in the Siege of Boston. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you, Barry. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, yeah, let's hold off for one second, if you don't mind. Okay, no problem. One more thing to, to go over. And that is um, our April history lesson for the month. So on the, uh, the 1st of April in 1775, the National, the, or excuse me, the New York Assembly passed its final militia act as a colony, uh, requiring that all males 16 to 50 years of age uh, to enlist under penalty of fine. So that's our first conscription of, of, uh, of us as a, uh, as a nation. On uh, April 3rd in 1776, uh, the Continental Congress uh, gave privateers permission to, quote, by force of arms, attack, subdue, and take all ships and other vessels belonging to the inhabitants of Great Britain. So we became pirates, uh, as it were which was a very good thing. It helped us quite a bit in <laughs> obtaining ships to help fight the war. Uh, on the 6th, also in 1776, uh, Congress resolved to allow exports from the colonies to any part of the world that was not under British rule. Uh, they also uh, uh, voted to allow the importation of goods, except those grown, produced, or shipped from any country under the King's rule. And then the following day on uh, the 7th of April in 1776, Captain John Barry, uh, commander of the Sloop of War Lexington, uh, made the first US Navy capture of a British warship, uh, the Sloop Edward under battle conditions. One more day after that, on the 8th, uh, John Adams arrived in Paris to replace Silas Dean uh, as a member of the commission representing the interests of the United States in France. Uh, Lee believes that Dean uh, is misappropriating French funds. Later it was discovered that Dean is also passing information along to the British. So that was not a good thing. Okay. Also in, the, in 1780, uh, the Br British commenced an attack on Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the British commander, General Henry Clinton, uh, began what is termed the one solid British triumph of the war. Uh, the bold move is, was intended to subjugate the South from Georgia, Georgia to the Chesapeake. Unfortunately, it didn't end well. On the 15th in 1783, uh, Congress ratified the preliminary peace treaty, excuse me, peace treaty 
signed in November of 1782. And on the 17th, uh, in 1783 also, uh, Spanish soldiers defeated the attacking British partisans at Fort Carlos, uh, which is uh, in present day uh, Arkansas Post National Memorial during what was called Colbert's Raid or Colbert's Raid, the only Revolutionary War action in Arkansas. And finally, on April 17th in 1775, Dr. Samuel Prescott reached Georgia with a message that the British were coming. That allows the militia to remove or destroy supplies and prepare to fight. Post writer Israel Bissell uh, began his ride through the colonies to deliver the news to Lexington. An unordered shot around the hurt world uh, began the American Revolution. So that all happened in this month. Uh, British forces retreated from Lexington back to Boston and were harassed and shot at all along the way by farmers and rebels. News of the events at Lexington Concord spread like wildfire throughout the colonies. It's a great, great day. So that's our history for the month. You're going to be tested later. <laughs> okay, now I would like to introduce uh, compatriot Charlie Fry, who is a cartographer, uh, information scientist, and U uh, U.S. Army veteran. His interests include genealogy, the history of the American Revolutionary War and Major League Baseball. And Charlie, we'll talk later about the MLB's decision about the uh, All-Star Game. Uh, as he learned of Isaac Fry's story, he uh, applied his skills to design an approach and designed an approach to geographic information systems to organize and document historical research projects. Applying his, this approach to his excuse me, applying this approach to is Isaac Fry's story yielded a wealth of information that could be organized in many ways. This supplied the sketch for the war that has begun, the first of his four books in the Duty, of, the Duty and the Call of Liberty series. As I said before, compatriot Fry is a member of the Redlands uh, chapter. And Charlie, we welcome you and it's taken away. All uh, right. All on Thank to you, you. Barry. So I will uh, share my screen. And actually, I was I'm glad that you had some of these uh, items on the, uh, um, let's see here. Here we go. Uh, on your uh, dates, because the uh, parallels are, uh, I think, uh, pretty good with Paul Dudley Sargent. So let me see here. Can everybody see my uh, screen here? I'm starting to move this up. There it is. Yes. Yes. Oh, there it is. Yay. All right. So I'm going to move this out of the way. So Paul Dudley Sargent is a, a figure that most of us have, un, have not likely heard of. And uh, I found that as I was uh, learning about the American Revolution and my Patriot ancestor, that uh, he uh, played a role that uh, was pretty pivotal to me having a, a, a Patriot ancestor. A bit of that. Uh, but although one thing I like is the uh, and it looks a lot better on a, on a presentation like this than the old one does so there did so I'm uh, happy about that too. So in my family's oral history, uh, my ancestor Isaac Fry uh, wasn't even thought of as a minimum. He, he was actually a, uh, breveted a major by the end of the war and there's a uh, uh, a road that runs by his house now called Major Isaac Fry Highway. And uh, the family had always told me and, and, and shared through the generations that uh, uh, when he got the alarm for uh, the Lexington and Concord uh, uh, encroachment of the British, uh, he told his wife, Elizabeth, that uh, the war has begun and I must be going. And as I was starting to write my first book, I wanted to start with that scene. And I got to thinking about, well, wait a second, how did he know a war was beginning? This was the day, you know, the, the morning before. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's saying this to his wife at about the time the first shots were being fired. And it's a, uh, it's a curious thing. And, 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 as, and as I dug into the, the, the reasons he would have thought a war was going to start to, you know, on, the, on the day that the alarm would reach him, uh, I, I uh, came across an interesting story about uh, uh, Paul Dudley Sargent. So first of all, though, 
the story about Paul Dudley Sargent is contradictory to what I learned initially uh, about the, particularly the New Hampshire uh, regiments and how they were organized uh, into the Continental Army in 1775 and then in 1776. And you know, most school kids in New Hampshire learned that John Stark, Enoch Poor, and James Reed were the uh, commanders of the uh, New Hampshire regiments that were uh, in the uh, siege of Boston and, and then fought in, in the uh, continental engagements in the following years. Um, however, this omits some interesting uh, facts that uh, have to do with my ancestor, uh, you know, becoming an officer and, and, and uh, undoubtedly uh, taking an active interest in the cause. So this is a, uh, I mean, a little bit, a little bit difficult to read and I tried to make it as large as I could, but uh, uh, this is an extract from uh, uh, Abiel Abbott Livermore's uh, History of Wilton, New Hampshire, which is a uh, extensive volume that I've depended on quite a bit in my research uh, as it also has the genealogy for everybody who was living in Wilton in the uh, uh, latter part of the 19th century. And I've highlighted a couple of uh, sections uh, that mention uh, commanders and in particular that this list is chronological. And initially, it's mentioning Colonel Sargent uh, several times as being a, uh, a commander of a regiment. And then in June, we're now talking about Colonel Reed's regiment. And early on, I, I didn't know what to make of that. And because and I'd always, you know, all the records that, of my ancestor being in the Continental Army uh, point to Colonel James Reed. And so this was something that, you know, didn't come off as a, you know, something intuitive to understand until I did a little more research. And so I wanted to find out who this Colonel Sergeant was. <coughs> so it turns out that uh, one of his, uh, I think it was one of his sons or grandsons produced a, a biography of Paul Dudley Sergeant. And he is as ardent a patriot as uh, uh, one could imagine. Uh, he is uh, a well-to-do merchant uh, of the, uh, you know, of the same sort that say John Hancock uh, was in Boston, and he was based in uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts originally. And he was active in the Sons of Liberty. And, and there's something that uh, that is important about that. And at that time, the Sons of Liberty was not a small organization. Uh, literally tens of thousands of people belonged. And they would have large meetings going into the, uh, uh, the beginning of the revolution as the uh, British government passed various uh, of the acts that uh, were either deemed intolerable or, uh, or uh, otherwise uh, objectionable. And Sergeant in particular had some expertise about organizing militias and, and he was vocal about that. And so they, the, the Sons of Liberty gave him the, uh, the task of uh, figuring out how to best organize the militias. And he initially went back in 1772 and organized the militia in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And something I've learned about those men, and it was, it was not just Gloucester, but it was Cape Ann and a few of the surrounding towns, they figured very prominently in the Battle of Reed's Hill. Uh, the, a, a large portion of the men from those towns fought actively, were in uh, Colonel Prescott's regiment that was in the center of that battle. And so it, it's not an accident that, that those, those men were front and center. And uh, Paul Dudley Sargent, I think, has uh, uh, quite a lot to uh, uh, do with their preparedness. Uh, then as he's doing this, um, my sense was, and, and, and it's, I'm reading into some of the, one of the lines that was uh, written into this biography is that uh, he had become uh, obnoxious to the Massachusetts government within a year or so, and in particular to the governor. And so he left the state to uh, avoid the, uh, the headaches of, of that kind of attention. And he moved to Amherst, New Hampshire. Uh, Amherst is still a small town. It's in the in the, in the middle of Hillsborough County, which is the uh, there's three counties that are on the southern edge of New Hampshire, and Hillsborough is the one in the middle. And he began organizing the militia in Hillsborough County, and that's where uh, the parallel of my aunt, patriot ancestor picks up, which is uh, my ancestors in Wilton, New Hampshire, which is uh, about a half day walk south of Amherst. And Amherst is the county seat, so you know there's a there's a I think some advantages for Sergeant being there, both that it's remote enough from the Massachusetts government, yet uh, central enough from an economic standpoint that he can still uh, make a living and, and, and continue with his uh, uh, his livelihood. 
And there are a number of, uh, I think, good sources uh, that I hadn't been aware of until I kind of looked through them, not for my own ancestor, but for mentions of Paul Dudley Sargent. Uh, Wilton uh, it became well known in the colonies in 1773. Um, they had uh, attempted to raise a new meeting house and as the cover of the book shows, it didn't go very well. Uh, they were, uh, they had a, a large beam of, of what we'll call it inferior quality uh, or, or that was supported by a, a post of inferior quality. And as a, a number of the men, and, and I think there were 19 of the men who were up on the second story uh, when the beam burst and, they, and the, the men, their tools and everything collapsed on them. Uh, I think it was four men who were killed uh, within, the, within the space of that day. Uh, my ancestor was wounded, uh, so to speak. He was injured by, uh, by something, although his injury wasn't described, but it did have an impact. Um, and I should, let me go back on one point there. And the, uh, the impact was that uh, apparently he didn't do much farming in 1774. Uh, and he was, uh, there's a, the New Hampshire archives has the uh, uh, court records uh, from the colonial times. And my ancestor was sued by a number of people, including his uh, brothers-in-law and uh, Paul Dudley Sargent. And so, uh, it, you know, the, the reason somebody would get sued was for non-payment and the reason you wouldn't be able to pay is you weren't able to work. And so I was beginning to see that there, you know, this event had uh, a direct bearing on my ancestor and, and ultimately how he, uh, I think, became involved in the army as in the militia as a Minuteman. So there's some other things that lead up to all of this. And this kind of gets back to some of those earlier uh, points that uh, Barry made in the, uh, in the dates. Um, so Parliament in 1774 passed what we uh, called the Coercive Acts. And they also established formal military rule over Massachusetts Bay Colony. So this resulted in the closure of the Port of Boston and essentially shutting down the economy in New England. Um, in July of uh, 1774, New Hampshire's first provincial Congress meets and they're beginning to get organized. And, and among the things that they did is they selected delegates that would uh, attend the, the first Continental Congress in 1774 in October. And you know, this begins to turn some lights on for me from the standpoint of you know, the, the, the idea of knowing that a war is going to begin uh, for my ancestor actually has much deeper roots. And the consensus of those roots then is expressed by this, uh, a number of, uh, of uh, decrees or dictates from the uh, First Continental Congress in that, uh, uh, first of all, is that you know, as British citizens living in colonies, they do have the same rights as British citizens in England. And on uh, December 1st, uh, they also uh, initiated a boycott of all British commerce and goods. So the, um, I find that you know, this is it's kind of an interesting thing in the sense that uh, it was good for us in 1774. And yet, uh, if you look at the uh, United States history with respect to uh, its initial foray into colonization of the Philippines, uh, they decided exactly the opposite and, and made sure the Philippines citizens were uh, no longer, uh, were not going to have the same rights as the citizens living in the United States. Um, early in uh, 1775, um, uh, based on the Continental Congress meeting and, and, and giving its dictates, the New Hampshire uh, has a, a, a Congress of its own and it meets and essentially absorbs all of the resolves of the First Continental Congress. And then uh, uh, the, there was a series of town and county meetings afterwards. And they were all uh, getting to this idea of a militia being needed and that martial skills and military arts needed to be uh, uh, first rate at this point. And so town meetings have occurred. Um, the idea of this Wilton meeting is that saying that we're going to pay for 25 minute men include, and, and that's gonna have two sergeants and two lieutenants uh, with it as well. And my ancestor was one of those two lieutenants. And then the, uh, uh, it, and this goes a little further and it begins to involve sergeant because he's, he's actually one of the leaders in the Hillsborough County Congress. And uh, what happens uh, in that Congress is that they resolve that uh, 
uh, sergeant is going to lead the uh, the men in these militias from the hills from the southern part of Hillsborough County, and and John Stark, who is very well known uh, as uh, New Hampshire's uh, leading contributor in the, in the, in the, in the as a general in the in the American Revolution, uh, would be leading the uh, the men from the northern uh, towns in Hillsborough County, and then it's essentially saying that they know they have more than one regiment of men, and they're going to divide it up uh, roughly equally, knowing that there's you know up up between three and 500 men for each of Sergeant and Stark to command. So if we take all of that and kind of look back on the idea of, you know, how did they know there was going to be a war? Uh, the idea is pretty straightforward and, and it gets to the premise of, of why they are uh, rushing up on and, and getting their uh, military skills and, and people organized is that uh, they're, they're not, going to just be defending their homes and, and their uh, and their land as they normally would have been with a militia. And then there is a specific reason, which is that New Hampshire has agreed to support Massachusetts if called. And support meant armed confrontation with ministerial troops. Uh, and one of the things I've learned over the years is the, is the way that people spoke about uh, their, their uh, political or economic leanings at that time. And, and, and Tories in particular were, uh, would have been saying that they were supporters of the government. Uh, however, in New England, Tories were the minority and uh, the government for many people was the enemy because it was curtailing their economy and their freedoms. And in supporting the, uh, the, 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 the idea of, of Massachusetts needing help, uh, that meant, you know, a confrontation with troops and they weren't there was no intention to back down and that meant you know in all, in all likelihood there would be a battle and they're, and they're obviously <clears throat> and a, and then a battle would be more so this was common sense i think to anybody who was involved in these town meetings and, and congresses particularly in, in in the first few weeks of april of 1775. so the alarm which was carried by uh uh, you know, most famously by Paul Revere, but also William Dawes and then Samuel Prescott, uh, you know, went, spread far and wide. And even by 2 a.m., uh, the southern tier of New Hampshire had uh, begun to receive uh, the alarm, particularly as you went up the Merrimack River, uh, a number of the uh, uh, um, towns were, were already mobilizing in the, in, the, in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, and you know, Wilton probably got that alarm probably a few hours later, somewhere between five and seven a.m. Uh, so that's you know, the, and now I you know, for me that was like okay, now I know more of a setting for my ancestor receiving that that alarm. And then uh, most of the southern tier uh, of Hillsborough County and Rockingham County, New Hampshire, which was the easternmost county, uh, marched that day, and many of them arrived in Concord uh, that evening and then uh, made their way to uh, Medford, which is a town immediately to the uh, north and west of Boston in, uh, in, on the next day. So that, and so Paul Dudley Sargent leads one of these regiments. Uh, <clears throat> when he uh, reaches the uh, southern border of New Hampshire, he has uh, under his command four or five companies. So he's, he's got a, uh, a regiment sized body of troops with him. So he's, uh, he's very much a, uh, uh, in the role of a colonel in charge of a regiment, which was a which was the typical military arrangement. However, uh, beyond the first couple of days of the alarm, things begin to get confused, and and, it, and it's uh, you know partly because you know New England is a relatively small area with with multiple governments. Uh, New Hampshire is its own colony; it has a government that's seated in Exeter, New Hampshire. And they immediately uh, call a Congress to figure out what they're doing because their you know, their militias just marched, and you know at this point there's not even a plan to support them with any kind of organized uh, uh, you know, way of you know how do you how do you uh, feed two thousand men who have now marched a day to the south and you know, how's this going to work out if we're going to achieve the the, uh, uh, the objectives of supporting Massachusetts and, and what does that mean now that they've marched. And that there's been a battle, um, and it was a confusing time to say the least. Um, uh, that uh, that uh, initial meeting of uh, what was ultimately going to be the state of New Hampshire's uh, uh, House of Representatives uh, did vote to uh, 
uh, elect a, a general and, they, and Nathaniel Folsom was, was that general. Uh, he was probably better known as an administrator and a facilitator. He, he was not a, a military mind and he certainly uh, was, was not the sort who was gonna compete with John Stark in terms of uh, tactics and capabilities. Uh, Stark was a, a well-known uh, adherent of uh, the uh, Rogers uh, Rangers School of uh, Irregular Warfare and uh, had served as such in the French and Indian War and, and in subsequent campaigns. And then things got confusing as well. There was a, a fellow named Stim Samuel Dudley, a New Hampshire res res resident, uh, but a Tory. And uh, he actually you know, walked into the uh, New Hampshire part of the camp and uh, stood up and told the uh, troops there that uh, General Ward, who was in charge of the Massachusetts men and said, you're no longer needed, you can go home. And 600 men did go home that day. Uh, so in the meantime, Sergeant had gone to Exeter to participate in that first uh, uh, Congress. And he came back pretty quickly and maybe prematurely as we'll see. Uh, while he is there, though, John Stark is voted by a show of hands to be in command of the New Hampshire troops rather than Nathaniel Folsom, who's not there. So essentially, we have two separate organizations occurring under the same heading of New Hampshire, but they know nothing about each other in the sense that the left hand and the right hand are not part of the same body knowingly. Um, by the time a week passes, another figure emerges, which is that of James Reed. Uh, he's from Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire, which is a little further to the west of Wilton in, in Hillsborough County. And Reed is also uh, somebody with some military experience and, and a lot of respect. He's a, he's a very uh, uh, I'm say direct, plain spoken sort of man who uh, gets things done. And, and, and that respect translates into uh, 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 some acclamation for companies to be formed underneath him as well. And by the end of this week, uh, the arrangements uh, in the camps around Boston are that there are 18 companies of New Hampshire men, 14 of which have uh, put themselves under John Stark. And then, uh, I should say not 18, but uh, 22. And then uh, four are under each of uh, Sergeant and uh, Reed. And, and this, uh, they know that's dis disproportionate. Uh, but um, so my ancestor for, for that time, based on those records was obviously in Sergeant's regiment. And I, and I think that made sense. Uh, and I, I should go back to those uh, uh, court records uh, from the standpoint that uh, of all those people so, who sued my ancestor, the only one who uh, did not fall through and collect was Paul Dudley Sargent. He had sued my ancestor three separate times and uh, under none of those times did he collect. And uh, I suspect he used that as leverage to uh, get my ancestor more involved in the cause from the standpoint that uh, if you can't pay your bills, can you at least serve in the militia and you know, help my cause out? And, and I think he more than likely uh, traded uh, you know, the uh, uh, honor of, of, uh, of uh, taking care of his debt in some fashion for helping Sergeant out. And as my ancestor ultimately became the, the, uh, the quartermaster of, of Sergeant's regiment, and those records show uh, what uh, he was doing from a transactional basis to uh, gain supplies for Sergeant's regiment. So food and funding end up being a, a central problem for all of the troops surrounding Boston in the first week or so uh, with regard to uh, you know, how do you lay siege to a, a, a town the size of Boston with 20,000 men. Uh, the, the New Hampshire's Provincial Congress essentially started a rotation of towns uh, sending supplies uh, in, by the wagon load. And volunteers had seen this need early on and, and had begun doing it even on the first day. Uh, but they needed everything, you know, you know, from the standpoint that these men were, uh, you know, there, but they didn't have much. Uh, you know, certainly not a, no more food than for uh, two or three days and no tents, no buildings. Uh, you know, it, was a, it was very much a chaotic camp. Um, by the middle, of, so so that's kind of the pressing concern for these legislatures, rather than putting people in command. Um, the uh, there's some interesting things about the, uh, the then you know, how are we going to fund this question? Uh, the New Hampshire Provincial Congress uh, actually uh, uh, went so far as to uh, uh, realize that you know, they weren't 
a, a, a wealthy state. Uh, and, and it was, it was going to take people you know, individually uh, stepping up to back what was going to happen. So they approved for 2,000 men, and they also uh, made an, an appropriation uh, from the standpoint that they were agreeing to take on the debt of funding the army. And when I say they were agreeing to take on the debt, I literally mean that the, uh, the representatives on the floor of, of, of that body agreed to be the bondsmen. And it was a sum of 10,000 pounds of lawful money. Uh, today, that is uh, closer to the idea of uh, maybe 300 to $500,000. So, you know, imagine, you know, essentially townspeople willing to uh, have that debt backed. Um, once that question was answered, the question of who is going to be in charge of this military operation becomes uh, most relevant. And interestingly, uh, the first commander who was appointed by New Hampshire's government was a man named Enoch Poor, who wasn't even there. So again, you know, we still have the uh, idea of the uh, New Hampshire troops and the, and the New Hampshire government not being in close enough contact, even though they were, you know, a one day ride apart, uh, being able to uh, organize themselves. And nobody from the legislature had gone down to the camp, and only Sergeant, uh, from what I can see, is the, is the only one from the camp who had gone up to be part of the legislature. And over and, and, and at the end of May, uh, that did change, however, and the uh, legislature begins to send people down to the camp. And what happens is that uh, there, there was a notice of uh, uh, Sergeant having secured three commissions for colonels in the Massachusetts arrangement, which makes sense given who Sergeant was because he was a Massachusetts resident who had recently moved to New Hampshire. So he still had all the contacts and the, and the, and the leverage to uh, uh, secure a part of the organization. Although it was, it was with the clause that until the state of New Hampshire uh, agrees to how many commissions they're going to provide. And I no nobody has a record of whether uh, um, it was going to be three or four commissions, uh, but it ended up being three. And then this begins to leave Sergeant out and, and officially does on June 3rd. And so Sergeant ends up securing a, co a, a commission to be in the Massachusetts arrangement and, is, and you know, effectively becomes a Massachusetts officer, even though his, his recent home is in New Hampshire. Uh, to think about uh, what happened, you know, adding all of this up together is that you know, you know, they're trying to make sense of and organize an effort where nobody's being paid, uh, although you know, most of them were under an arrangement similar to how Wilton, uh, New Hampshire, did things, which is to say that we we're willing to fund our, a certain number of people for a certain uh, duration, and uh, that was, I think, generally understood to be measured in weeks, not months or years. And then, uh, you know, 20,000 men respond to the uh, you know, countryside immediately around Boston. And, you know, there's, there's no, you know, essentially no, no toilets, no barracks, and very little discipline. So it's a, a pretty wild scene uh, by, the, by military standards, to say the least. Uh, my ancestor being a quartermaster and, and, and a quartermaster under sergeant, you know, had to be responsible for obvious things, such as digging latrines and so on early on. And... Even a lot, a lot of these histories uh, neglect the fact that George Washington uh, is still being uh, ratified as the commander of the Continental Army, and he's not there yet. So there's, you know, so General Ward is very much in charge, and New Hampshire is very much in charge of its own troops and trying to figure out how they're going to organize this. So, with Sergeant having his own regiment, that was the uh, 27th Massachusetts Regiment, and uh, they participated uh, in the. Uh, in the coming uh, uh, year and a half, uh, both at the Battle of Bunker Hill and the Battle of Long Island. Uh, Sergeant uh, gained a little bit of um, uh, historical confusion for, for a long time because he uh, um, was noted and, and claimed to have been wounded during the Battle of Bunker Hill. However, as, as uh, people have dug into this, in particular, uh, J.L. Bell, who writes the Boston 1775 blog, is a, a, an excellent historian from the Boston area, uh, took a look at this and looked at the same biography, the, uh, the, the uh, 
clipping of uh, the sketch of Sargent's portrait is the same one from that biography. And he was able to ascertain that uh, Sargent still had four companies at that time, and they were uh, sent to Lechmere Point, which was on the northern banks of the Charles River, uh, immediately to the uh, south of, uh, of uh, Charleston and, and the battle. And they were there to guard against a second British landing, which would have uh, allowed for a, uh, a pretty open path to the American headquarters in Cambridge or to cut off the retreat uh, from Charleston. So this was you know, definitely part of the battle, but it was also um, uh, not in a great deal of danger, although uh, the uh, British gondolas who were in the, uh, what they called the back bay then, uh, were, when it actually had water, uh, were firing into uh, and at these troops that, Sar that uh, Sergeant was uh, commanding. And there were somewhere between two and 3,000 men. Uh, sergeants were 200 of them. And uh, Sergeant is uh, grazed by a cannonball. And uh, that is the cause of this wound that he had claimed. And, and, and it's quite plausible. And others, there are other accounts that uh, uh, um, corroborated the, the you know, Sergeant's claim. So it was just interesting because Sergeant had never, Sergeant's troops didn't uh, end up in the battle, although it ends up being quite confusing later. And again, back to revisionist history is that uh, three, of, three of the companies that uh, were added to Sergeant's regiment uh, were added in late July. They were actually from Stark uh, and Stark, and they fought in the battle under Stark at the, on the front line. And so uh, if you look at the Massachusetts uh, roles, uh, those men are uh, under sergeant and are taking fairly heavy casualties during the battle. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, Redlands chapter uh, members, Melvin Harrell's ancestor was in one of these companies and was wounded during the battle. And so you know, it, it's uh, confusing as to whether he was, you know, who, who, whose uh, regiment he was in. And it wasn't until I later found a uh, uh, a roll of the food that was being provided to the troops for, uh, in particular for Stark, it was, was to see that the New Hampshire uh, food was being given to those three companies up through July. And so that's you know, ultimately the basis for why they were in Stark's regiment. So in many ways, the politics of uh, you know, Sergeant's history in uh, Massachusetts, and whether he was really a uh, uh, person who was loyal to and would uh, obey the, uh, the New Hampshire uh, provincial uh, government's uh, dictates was in question. And the acceptance of the Massachusetts commissions, given the poor communication, uh, essentially left a door open, particularly for Enoch Poor to become a, uh, a colonel and being the first colonel that was was actually uh, appointed uh, was, was quite a I think quite a surprise for Sergeant to say the least and I, and I thought it was you know, unfortunate given how much effort he had put into organizing the militia and uh, essentially taking personal responsibility for ensuring the preparation of Hillsborough County, New Hampshire, as they responded to the alarm. He served through the end of 1776, but he fell ill and ill enough that he uh, had to resign his commission. And so he goes home at the end of 1776, but uh, as soon as he recovers, he uh, shifts to the, uh, the, the role of a privateer, given his ownership of ships and, and, and so on. He, he, he actually had a, uh, a, a very good basis to become a, a privateer in, in, in the uh, war and, and, and can it, continue to do that quite successfully. And then uh, he ultimately uh, moves to Sullivan, Maine, and he dies there in 1828. So he's, uh, and it's been interesting because his, his family's got the reputation of being fairly pr uh, prickly about his uh, uh, war service. And you know, for everything I've investigated, there's no uh, claim that he's made that is false. And, and, and he is certainly uh, underappreciated in the same way that uh, say William Dawes or Samuel Prescott is relative to the alarm of April 19th. And then uh, I wanted to add a little bit about my books. I'm, I'm currently writing the third book in the Duty and the Cause of Liberty series. And the uh, first book in particular, you know, a lot of this Paul Dudley Sargent research was underpinning the early chapters in this book. And I, and I definitely cover, uh, uh, that, cover that in more detail than I do in here. 
in this presentation. And those books are all available on, on Amazon. And then last, I wanted to include a little bit about where I got the name Duty and the Cause of Liberty. Uh, it's actually uh, something that my uh, ancestor's wife, Elizabeth, writes. Uh, she's writing to him uh, uh, later in uh, 1776. Uh, the Third New Hampshire Regiment under James Reed is now at uh, uh, in the Fort Ticonderoga uh, vicinity. They're right across the lake in what was called Camp Independence. And um, she's starting to uh, realize that this, you know, this war is going to be a lot longer. And, 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 the, and the context that she's writing this in is that she doesn't desire that he should neglect his duty. But if the, uh, you know, the country in general is not behindhand, she writes it in the uh, cause of liberty. Uh, she, she, wants she wants his company at home rather than uh, off in the army. And so, uh, and, and, and is asking whether he expects a discharge in the context of this. But you know, I, I, I thought it was interesting to be able to take that uh, uh, way of thinking about things. And uh, what, I, what I ultimately had found out is that uh, somebody had already uh, co-opted the, uh, the cause of liberty as, a, as a, uh, a series title for a Civil War series. And so I needed to use something that was not the same just so I didn't infringe on that. And so I could take uh, uh, a little bit more of what Elizabeth wrote and uh, turn it into uh, something uh, that uh, very aptly uh, encompasses uh, Isaac Fry's service through the war because he uh, he did it he did his duty for over nine years in the in the War of the Revolution and uh, uh, this this uh, summed it up quite well. So with that, I am uh, happy to take any questions or. Uh, or hear any comments and observations that you might have. And I think it may be easier to stop sharing the screen here. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Um, any questions for, for Charlie on this one? It's a great story. Very and, nice, uh, Charlie. Uh, sure. Charlie, I was, I've got one question for you. Um, it, it, towards the end there, you said that uh, the family is a bit prickly about his service. And however, you've seen nothing to really warrant that kind of behavior. Do, do, you, do, do you know why they're, they're so prickly about it? I think it has more to do with the fact that we have the internet today as a basis to find you know, everything out about somebody's service. Uh, and you know, up until the 1980s, you know, it depended on where you went and what you found. And so uh, there were, you know, there obviously are, there are letters who, I mean, Sergeant had one, um, one bad mark on his record near the end of 1776, which is that some of the officers in his regiment uh, on Long Island had been caught uh, looting uh, some of the homes. Uh, you know, that's not Sergeant's fault. I mean, this was just people not doing what they were supposed to be doing. And uh, the officers were, uh, 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 arrested and, and, and tried for that. So it's, but it's, it's when you find those kinds of things, they reflect on the commander and uh, if you find them independently of anything else. And given the, uh, uh, the relative depth at which the other records of Sergeant and his contributions are buried. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that leads to that prickliness. Okay. Thank you. It's a wonderful story, very well told by you, Charlie. Thank you. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've enjoyed finding it. It's quite a, uh, uh, it's just one of those things that you know, for me, it, it explains so much about where my ancestors' uh, inclinations came from. Do you have a particular source for genealogy? Yes. It has shifted yes. over the years. I have, uh, for many years, I depended on the published genealogy. So, for instance, the, uh, the New, New England Genealogical Society's books that they've produced were excellent sources. And I, and I still use a lot of the uh, town histories because they not only give genealogies, but they also give some sketches. Um, but lately, the uh, FamilySearch.org uh, tools have become, uh, I think, preeminent in their ability to, you know, and I use them to research my books in the sense that I, I, I literally research every 
uh, Patriot really? with a state park and learn their family's history. And I'm able to do that consistently with, with within there. So, you know, just finding out how old they are, whether they were married. Oh, and so on. Hey, Charlie, you, Charlie. Charlie, on the, the point about the, the tools that you're using, do you find Fold 3 has anything valuable for you? Oh, absolutely. Fold 3 has been a gold mine for particularly the roles and the pensions. Uh, the, okay. uh, the roles have allowed me to write history that hasn't been written before in the sense that when you start to look at things at a very detailed level from inside of a regiment or a company, the roles are the uh, best way to describe what's happening to the, to the people in the company. And then the, um, the pensions actually allowed me to prove uh, where my ancestor was in some cases, because the men who were giving their affidavits uh, to get the pensions would describe their change of commands and the locations that they were at during the war. And uh, in particular, that uh, there was no role of uh, any of the New Hampshire men being at Yorktown, but uh, uh, there were uh, five companies of New Hampshire men who were uh, under the light infantry under Lafayette and Alexander Scammell. And th neither of them actually produced the role that survived. And it was only through those affidavits of saying they were under those commanders uh, that I could find, you know, who was, I've been slowly accumulating a list of who was in each of the, those regiments just because there is not one. And, 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 and people who uh, today, you know, would like to know that kind of service, you know, because it is so well documented otherwise in terms of the role they played militarily, uh, you know, it'd be nice to know if your Patriot ancestor was in, the, in that unit. Thank you. Any other questions for Charlie? Charlie, thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, I hope you all did as well. Let's give him a thank round you. of applause. Thank you. And we'll see you again on another of your uh, riveting speech or talks uh, in the near future. <laughs> Okay, let me share my screen again. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes. All right, great. Okay, so I've got some announcements to make. Um, the first one, here we go, is uh, an update on some of our youth awards. Um, last month we announced uh, Cadet Master Sergeant Jessica Pham of the Scripps Ranch uh, High School Air Force ROTC unit uh, as our chapter winner of the JROTC Enhanced JROTC program. Uh, since that time, we learned that Cadet Pham received a huge uh, promotion. Uh, she now leads the entire uh, CA 935 unit uh, at Scripps Ranch as a cadet colonel. Uh, that, that's just beyond what I could imagine, going from a ma master sergeant up to a colonel in one big fell swoop. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find out about this unusual promotion until after the state JROTC committee uh, had chosen this year's winner. Uh, if we had, this announcement certainly would have played heavily in her favor. So as a consolation, we will award Cadet Fam with a good citizenship medal along with her JRO, JROTC medal and certificate later this month. Also, uh, even bigger news is that uh, last month we uh, announced the chapter winner of the Sea Cadet Outstanding Citizenship Award uh, as uh, Miguel Harris Barlasan. Uh, uh, I am pleased to report uh, that Cadet Petty Officer, Second Class Barlasan, is the very first uh, first place winner in the California Society Cadet of the Year Award. He will uh, formally be formally announced at the upcoming CASAR annual meeting uh, that's being held next week. So Cadet Barlason took home another $1,000 uh, scholarship for his achievement at the state level and now goes on to compete at the national level. So let's please wish him luck. 
and also wished Philip Henshaw well. Yes. I want to announce, I'm pleased to announce a, uh, that our own former Color Guard Commander, Skip Cox, has recently been appointed to the National Education uh, Committee. Uh, he is a graduate of the School of Business at, at LSU. Uh, he continued to serve LSU as a distinguished faculty advisor. Uh, he led, uh, was CEO of Cox Financial Advisors, uh, which did uh, state planning and consulting for the Louisiana and Texas Automobile Dealers Association. More importantly though, he is a history buff, particularly the American Civil War, where he has portrayed General, uh, Lieutenant General James Longstreet uh, in reenactments uh, and speaking uh, on the Battle of Gettysburg. He is a member of the Charles M. Russell Museum in Great Falls, Montana, and the National Society of Sons of American Revolution, obviously, uh, the Civil War Trust, and the National Museum of the Civil War Soldier in Petersburg. Skip, um, you may not know, is a, an avid fly fisherman and writer, uh, having authored several fly fishing articles published locally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, when you see Skip, please congratulate, congratulate him on this well-earned uh, position and give him all of your feedback on what we should be doing with, with our educational programs. He is uh, one of the best advocates that I know of uh, for our education things at the national level. So Skip, congratulations. I know you're, you joined us today. I also want to uh, announce that we are working towards uh, participating in the USS Stark Memorial Award. Uh, recently, we've discovered that uh, Marine PFC John F. Middleswort has become the 300th uh, USS Oklahoma unknown uh, to be identified by the Defense Department POW MIA Accounting Agency. Uh, this was done through DNA. Uh, and he will be buried here in uh, San, San Diego, which is his hometown. Uh, services are scheduled for June 8th, and we are looking to participate as a color guard unit, as an honor guard uh, in that event. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we will uh, be able to announce more information on that soon. And if you can make that event, that would be wonderful. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> I also want to announce that on Memorial Day, our chapter is hosting a national event to pay tribute to our nation's fallen servicemen and women. Uh, several chapters across the country have sponsored events like this to remember uh, things like the Battle of Morris Creek Bridge, the Battle of Kettle Creek and others. Uh, events like this uh, have well over 300 attendees from across the country uh, participating. So we will be using Zoom and uh, YouTube live streaming uh, to accommodate everyone who wants to participate and watch. Some mm -hmm. are recorded uh, prior to the event because the locations are somewhat, uh, or where some of the activities uh, place. We can't do them all live. Uh, for mm -hmm. instance, yes, sir. Um, is that posted on our website as an event? Yes, the Memorial Day tribute is posted as an event. Great, thank you. Yep. So uh, as, as an example, um, because some of these places, uh, these events, these events for our event, some events, uh, Philip Hinshaw, who is a former crew member, uh, will lay a wreath on the USS Midway. Uh, wreaths will be laid at Mount Soledad, National Veterans Memorial, uh, Liberty Station, Naval bases Coronado and Point Loma. Uh, our color guard is supporting each of these activities and musket volleys are planned at select locations. Uh, as I just mentioned that there is this information on the events page, we are working on releasing the actual registration uh, by Monday morning. So please register by May 15th to ensure your spot uh, is seating may be limited uh, on Zoom. 
If you'd like to get a better feel for what this event is like, you can watch uh, the Battle of Morris Creek Bridge uh, replaying event, and a link is available in the chapter's website under the, uh, the events tab. Uh, I hope you all uh, can make that. It will be a, a very uh, well attended event. <clears throat> As a reminder, uh, the National Society of Sons of American Revolution is proceeding with holding its 131st Annual Congress uh, in Washington. Uh, again, this is a face-to-face -face meeting, barring any orders from, uh, from the Washington government or, or health department. Barry, may I Sir. interject for a moment? Sure. Um, Paula, um, on the memorial service, the car is definitely invited to attend and participate. The CAR, that's not, that's yes. not mine, that's... Uh, oh. That's, oh, that's Judy's. That's Judy, I'm sorry, Judy. <laughs> yes, you are. Um, my problem is I don't, I have brand new active members and uh, I'm, I'm getting some reluctance as far as putting anything together on a video. All right, Understood. I perfectly understand that. All right, thank you though, but uh, you are invited. Thank you very much. I know, Barry already invited us. <laughs> okay. Paula, Joe, you're invited too. Thank yes. you. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so uh, again, the uh, fall board of, meeting, uh, board of Managers meeting will be in Riverside this year. Uh, hopefully, uh, many of you can attend. Uh, if you've never been to the Mission Inn in Riverside, it's a wonderful place uh, to have a meeting and stay. <clears throat> so, some upcoming events. Uh, we are holding our regular chapter board meeting uh, at its regular time uh, this Thursday on April 15th at 7 via Zoom. Uh, all members are invited. Uh, please see the events page. Uh, on our website uh, for registration links. We will have our last chapter meeting before the summer break on May 15th. Oh. And I hope this is our last <laughs> mandatory virtual meeting uh, so we can resume in-person meetings starting in August. In any case, we will continue to present the meetings live on Zoom and on the San Diego chapter YouTube channel uh, for anyone who can't make a, a physical meeting. Oh, uh, again, nice. on Memorial Day, uh, May 31st, mm -hmm. uh, we're hosting the tribute of replaying uh, ceremony of via Zoom and YouTube. And it looks as though we might be uh, on the road to some type of normalcy uh, as the Coronado Independence Day Parade looks like it's going to be held in some form or fashion. Yay. Uh, we don't quite know what that format is yet, but the chapter does plan to participate in any way we can. Uh, we have we expect to have our dignitaries and others riding in Mustang convertibles, uh, courtesy of the San Diego Mustang Club, uh, which uh, compatriot uh, Fred Hall has uh, uh, been able to get to, to work with us. And we'll keep you posted on, on how we proceed as we get closer to the event. Also on Independence Day weekend, we will be partnering with several of the Balboa Park International Colleges. As always, we will be at the uh, House of Spain and we look forward to working with others such as the House of the USA. Uh, for an event like this, we need volunteers to, to spend a few hours to visit as visitors uh, explaining what the, Ameri the Sons of the American Revolution is all about and the work we do in the community. So please uh, see Philip for the House of Spain and see uh, uh, Duncan uh, for, for the House of, of the USA and others. And then on August 21st, we will come back from our summer break and have hopefully our in-person meeting. Yeah. Uh, we're, look, we're looking at uh, some different, uh, potentially more cost-effective and centralized locations uh, versus the uh, Bernardo Heights Country Club. Uh, and we'll let you know where as soon as we can. Okay. So any questions on upcoming events? Barry, I just really enjoy the history at the very beginning of the meeting. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Okay, so Larry, I am... Did you want me to present the flag? Yo, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I completely forgot about that. Let me stop sharing and I'll let you share. Actually, just put me up on the screen, Barry. Uh, I can't, I don't know how to do that. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> let me stop. Uh, okay, let me talk and then let's see if we can't get a presenter. Okay. Um... Uh, just to share. Turn off your sharing. I did. Okay. Um, we have blank screen up there now. Stop share. There we go. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. Am I on now? No. Yes. I'm, I, on. I, we're still looking at you, Barry. Oh. I'm sure oh, well, in the gallery, but we can see you, and okay. you will light up when you speak. All right. Well. The short, um, I am a new dual member of the Oaks chapter of the Michigan Society, and their meetings are being held by Zoom. So I attended my first meeting, and at that first meeting, the Michigan Society had purchased fl uh, centennial flags for all their chapters. And I was there, and the uh, state president was also there. And he said, I've got some uh, extra flags. So he asked if our chapter would like one. And I said, yes. So we have now got a additional flag and here it is. Oh, it's beautiful. Yay. This is it for the bicentennial. Um, and so now we have five flags and as you can see it's got the we've had the French put on it and we have the new flagpole which the uh, which the uh, chapter had approved uh, the purchase of so just wanted wow. to make the announcement that this is now here. Great looks good. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Nice job Duncan. Beautiful. <laughs> Okay. Let me reshare my screen. Okay. So in closing, uh, I would ask you to all stand and I will recite the, benedic the benediction. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and the blessings of God Almighty be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Patriot Hall, can you lead us in the recessional, please? He must have stepped out. So I will lead it. Until we meet again, let us remember our obligation to the store for us. Who gave us our constitution, the Bill of Rights, and independence and independence of freedom. Amen. Color guard, would you please retrieve the colors? Hut and hut. Forward. March. Mark time. March. Color guard. Alt. Right face. Retrieve the colors. Cut. About face. Mark time. March. Forward. March.
Okay, this concludes our today's meeting. Uh, thank you all for attending, and I look forward to seeing you again next month uh, for our uh, Zoom meeting on uh, May 15th. Thank you, Barry. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Good job, Barry. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have mm -hmm. a great day. Thank you, you, and have a good weekend, everybody. Okay. Blessings thank to you. you all. I love you guys. Bye. Great talk. Bye. Hi, Will. Hi. Hi, Phil. Hi, Ernie. Hi. Hello, Will. Greetings. Glad to see you. Good to see you, Ernie. Hi, Phil. Everyone, take care. Be safe. Okay. Thank you, Wes. Thank, Thank you, Wes. so much for coming. Yep. Thank you, John. Good